Well, it's April, and hard charge, obstacles of life, and a little different from last week, have an Easter set up, now we have an obstacle course set up. And many of you would think, how hard can an obstacle course be in a church? Well, let me walk you through the obstacle course and see what you guys would think. This first is an eight-foot wall. That's a pretty high. You have to jump over this wall. Whether you use the rope or just jump over, you could do whatever you would like. And you come down, and you crawl through this tunnel, or slide through the tunnel. Then you come over here, and these 40-pound tires, you have to reset from here to over here, from top to bottom, and then the bottom to the top. Then you have to climb this 12-foot rope and ring the bell. Then you have to come over here, and you have to do a set of 10 bench presses, and there's 45 on each side with a 45-pound bar, which is about 135 pounds. Then you have to drop and do 10 push-ups. Then you have to come over here and do the tire walk. And then you have to come over here and do the monkey bar, and you have to touch five rings on the monkey bar. And then you have to come down here on the floor, and then you have to pick up this 60-pound tire, two of them, at the same time, and run them across the front of the auditorium. Oh, that's not done yet. Oh, that's the easy part. And then when you come over here, you have to get on this gigantic bicycle that I couldn't even sit on. It's, it's, you know, really big. And you have to ride this without using your feet on the floor all the way back across the front of the auditorium and to the finish line. And at the finish line, we'll see who will have the splits, we'll have the set, and we'll know exactly who it is. And we have five contestants. This, son, this day, we're using the adults. I picked, well, some of them wanted to do it. So there's five guys that uh, think that they can handle this challenge. I don't know if they can or not, but they think they can. And in order that they are going to be participating is Daniel Edgington. Daniel, make your way down here. Let's give Daniel a round of applause. The second is going to be Ben Ludwig. Ben Ludwig. The third is going to be Brett Thomas. The fourth is Ramon Rivera. And the fifth and final contestant will be Chad Dunham. We have two spotters. They'll be Jody Griebel and Mike Palmer. Mike Palmer. So in case anything happens, it is these guys' fault that they fall and break their neck. We're doing due diligence. We're doing everything is within our power that they don't hurt themselves. So I got the two whippiest guys I could find to, to be the spotters. All right. Are you contestants ready? All right. Let's get it behind. Let's get on our feet and let's make them happy. Let's see what we can do. On your mark, get set, go. Thirty-second penalty for skipping an obstacle. Thirty-second penalty. One minute and 15 seconds. Can we go ahead and reset the stage? Do the tires and reset. Mike, can we reset the stage? All right, that's our time to beat. 
one minute and 15 seconds with a 30 second penalty which would make that what there you go that's preset we already knew the consequences there are consequences to skipping obstacles if not we just run through it and just have a training course so there you go so I've already done it many times your job who said that your job is to be quiet and enjoy the show okay Ben Ludwig on your mark Get set, go! One, 121.4, he takes the lead, Ben Ludwig's in the lead. Our third contestant is Brett Thomas. Ready? On your mark, get set. Ben Ludwig still has the lead because somebody couldn't ring the bell. He only climbed the rope three different times. I tell you, if he'd take more after his dad instead of his mom, he'd have won that thing. All right. Our fourth contestant is Ramon. On your mark, set, go.
Keep going. There you go. Our last and final contestant. You are. Our last and final contestant comes from the Wichita Fire Department. His name's Chad Dunham. Chad told me this is a piece of cake. He said that his contestants that are against him are like junior high children compared to him. I'm lying about that. I'm trying to pump him up. Are we ready? On your mark, set, go. See, it's not as easy as it looks. Not a bad little obstacle course for a church. And the winner is Ben Ludwig. What is his winning time? 121.4. You know, <laughs> the winning prize is they get to do it again because on the last Sunday of the month, all the challengers that win during the week, they'll compete on the last Sunday for the grand prize. Now, next week, our girls are going to be doing it. And you think it's tough for the guys, we make it harder for the girls. No, we won't do that. We'll make it a little easier for the girls. But uh, we have our contestants for next week, and it'll be fun for next week. So, uh, obstacles. What we perceive as obstacles, God sometimes uses for our good. We sometimes do not see what God sees because we see in the physical, we see in the finite. But God uses different things within our life, and we all have obstacles within our life. And there's stories within the Bible that tells us how we perceive things and how God perceives things. There's a story found in John chapter 6 where he was teaching. The multitude started coming up, and there were 5,000 people there. And the disciples said, how are we going to feed all these people? And Jesus said, just have them sit down. And they said, we, we wouldn't have enough money 
to, to feed all these people. And Jesus said that he wanted to test them. He wanted to test them to find out what they would do. And then Philip said, we found this little boy. He has some fish and he has some loaves of bread. What is so little amongst so many? Jesus, again, was trying to test them to find out whether they understood the power that he has and the power that they could have. And he said, why don't you just have all the men sit down? The Bible said there were 5,000 men that sat down. And he distributed the bread. He distributed the fish. And you know the story. There were 12, ba 12 baskets of fish and bread left over. And the people were marveled at the power that Jesus had over the elements, over the elements of physics and of material sustenance. The disciples looked at that and they marveled. But it was an opportunity for Jesus to test them because the Bible says that Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew what he was going to do. The disciples didn't know, but Jesus knew. And in our obstacles of life, when we see things that are overwhelming, that are so big that we're wondering what in the world are we going to do we have to understand, Jesus already knows. He knows what you are going to need to do, how to focus on what you should do. And he's setting the example in front of you for what some things we should do. John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, is the text that we're going from. And I want to read uh, verse 6 of that. He says, but this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. He himself knew what he would do. The disciples, the crowd was massive. The disciples were fearful. They were trying to do only what they could do. They did not understand what he could do. And in our obstacles of life, we have to get in our hearts and in our minds, it's not necessarily only what you can do, it's what he can do through you. And through our faith, and through God's power, we can do great and mighty things. But sometimes our circumstances hinder us from allowing God to do great things. George Mueller said this, Speaking of the obstacles in the Christian life, I say, and say it deliberately, trials, obstacles, and difficulties, and sometimes defeats, are the very food of faith. What does that mean? That means sometimes our obstacles and even our failures motivate us not to quit. The failures, the defeats, they get up and they say, you know what, I came so close. We could take Wichita State Shockers. They came so close. Were they a great team? Yeah. But you know what, they're not going to say next year, oh, we made it to the Final Four. Uh, it's close enough. You know what they're going to do? In the offseason, they're going to say, what is it that I need to take that next step? They're going to take a failure, a loss of a game, and they're going to look at that and they say, I don't want to just be satisfied. I want to win. It puts that hunger within their life, a hunger within that team, that I am not going to let a failure finish me. And in our lives, sometimes the circumstances and the tragedies and the failures within our life build up within us an ability to have success. Now, what do we do? How do we get that perspective? Instead of saying, oh, no, oh, I guess I should just call it in. I guess it's over with. I guess I failed. There needs to be a hunger, a built-in desire to understand that the obstacles within our life may be there for a particular purpose. And the obstacles are in our life may not be what we want to go through, but can be put in our life for God's provision within our life. Now, sometimes, I will say, obstacles within our life are there because of our stupidity. Amen to that? We sometimes make our own obstacles. Sometimes we put our obstacles in front of our life and we say, oh, no, what did I do here? And God is saying, until you trust in me, until you put where I need to be within your life, these obstacles may be there to protect you from going any further. That brick wall right there, that eight-foot wall, I mean, if it was me running this thing, I bet you think I'm going to jump over it. But if it was me, I guarantee you I'd get about right here, and I would try to get up this wall, and that wall would keep me 
this eight-foot stupid wall would keep me from doing anything on this other side. Now, you know what? I, I guarantee you, if I thought, you know what? If I spent two weeks getting over that wall, learning how to get over that wall, taking lessons from these five contestants to get over that wall, I guarantee you, I can get over that wall. But you know the first time I tried to get over that wall? I'm old and fat, and I probably couldn't get over that wall. Now, I could go through the tunnel, and I could do the tires, and I could do a lot better job than my boy going up that rope. I mean, come on. I mean, that was a joke. I mean, he climbed that rope three different times, and he only lost by four seconds, three seconds. So, I mean, but you know what? If the wall, the first obstacle we face, keeps us from doing the rest of the obstacle course, that wall is a hindrance. But you know what? That wall that may be in front of our life may be the deliverance to motivate us, to prepare us for the rest of the obstacle course. You are not going to be able to do the obstacle course of life unless we are prepared physically, spiritually, and mentally. So when you look at those obstacles, what are those obstacles in front of us for? Here's the first point. God's outlook concerning life's obstacles. God has never, God is never overwhelmed with your obstacles. God is not in heaven. Oh, what, 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 what am I going to do? What, 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 what should I make him do here? What, what? God is saying, hey, trust me. Let me maneuver you. If you put your faith and confidence in me, allow me to do what I need to do. Uh, Sherlock Holmes and Mr. Watson, they were out camping one day. And they set their tent up, and, and they finally went to bed. They did the campfire, and they finally went to bed. And, and about four hours later, Sherlock Holmes wakes up, and he looks up at the stars. He leans over to Mr. Watson and wakes him up, and he goes, Look up, Mr. Watson. What do you see? He says, Oh, I see billions of stars, which means there's billions of galaxies. And I see that the constellations, and I see that it's a beautiful, going to be a beautiful day, and no, no clouds, and it's just gorgeous. And they stop for a little bit, and Mr. Watson asks, Mr. Holmes, what do you see? I don't see our tent. <laughs> Sometimes we see things differently. Sometimes we don't see the obvious within our life. We were in a tent, but I look up and the tent is gone. Or we think something, but the obvious is in front of us, and we do not see the obvious. And sometimes the very thing that is right dad smack in front of our face, we can't see. And sometimes we need training and equipping in order to take that next level. Sometimes we have to. In Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 7, it says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? God can do whatever he desires. But God does a lot with a little. He does a lot with a little. Just like the boy with the little fish and the barley. He said, let it, give it to me. The same example that Jesus used the fish and the barley, he can use with you. He doesn't need everything to be successful. He wants to use the little things within the life. And God can do great and mighty things through the little things within our life. Through something that was so simple. That was, that was so easy for somebody else. God can just move and make it happen for you. Well, uh, what's his name? His name's Charles Elliott. Was, he had the task of, of building the bridge over the Niagara River. And he was struggling because he could do this side, but it was before the technology, and it was, it was stressful. And he goes, he goes, I can't get started because I have, to, I have to start to connect both sides of the river, and I can't get my line to the other side of the Niagara River. So he started thinking one day, and he said, what can I do? And he came up with an idea of, of a kite flying contest. And to, to put a cord on a kite and fly the kite across the river. And a young man says, I can build a kite that's strong enough that can get into the air and that I can fly the cord to the other side. And they had that contest and this boy won. A little insignificant boy that flew a kite across the Niagara River so the Niagara Bridge could be built. What's the boy's name? I don't know. 
But you know what? We have the bridge because a boy did a little thing, but it caused a great success. And it may not be a gigantic issue, but it could be very successful. We think about a carpenter building the house, and the house is gigantically built, and it's, got, it's gorgeous. But you know what? Before the house could be successful, they have to tunnel electricity to that house. And sometimes somebody has to use a little backhoe, and they have to connect the electricity to the pole in order for the house to be successful. So somebody has to get in a backhoe or dig the hole, and they say, man, my job is worthless. All I'm doing is digging ditches. All I'm doing is connecting electricity. But the house is worthless unless it's connected to the power. And the only way it can be connected to the power is if somebody does the meaningless, the little things, in order for the big thing to be successful. It may not be great. It may not be with grandeur, but it can be exactly what God wants us to do. We cannot allow us to understand that God does great and mighty things through the little things of life. He used Jonah to turn a city to God. He used a stuttering Moses to free his people from slavery. And he used a teenage boy by the name of David to slay a giant. All three of those things are simple things, little things that God used an individual to do great and mighty things. God sees beside and beyond the obstacles of life. He sees way beyond it. He sees a different perspective of what we see. We are finite. We see from our perspective. God has everything. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We cannot see beyond our limitations. God doesn't look at us. He looks at Him. He looks at what He wants to do within our life. We cannot see beside our limitation. And when we look at our limitations, the limitations that we have keep us from going any further. And lessons learned through the obstacles of our eternal value. Think of the instances for this moment. There's some things in the Bible. When Abraham was offering Isaac in a sacrifice. You know, we watched the Bible uh, on TV, and that was one of the things I had all kinds of questions on, on text and on the phone call. Why would God cause Abraham to offer his son that didn't make sense? And I said, you know what? I, I, I wouldn't have a hard I mean, I would today because my boy failed on the rope. I mean, I, get, I wouldn't have a hard time offering him. I mean, but why would we sacrifice our kids? Why would we sacrifice our kids? And the whole picture is, it's not about the sacrifices. Was Abraham willing to put God first? And when Abraham was willing to put God where he needed to be, guess what? God provided exactly what needed to be done without any harm to Isaac. When we look at, are we willing to trust in God in every area of our life? When we are willing to trust in God, it makes no difference our limitations because God isn't limited to our limitations. Moses on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments. He, he, he had the privilege and the power to communicate to God, to give to us our commandments. Moses, a stuttering guy that says, Lord, not me. Why me? I can't even talk. Send somebody else. But yet, Moses, being willing to follow after God, got a hold of God, and God gave him what we have now as our commandments of life. It's a simple thing, but it's so meaningful. And in Christ's teaching to us today, Christ gives us teaching that is unbelievable. In James chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, it says this, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If we have faith, God will work within our life, and we will not lack anything in order to be successful with the obstacles of our life. Now, we look at obstacles, and we all have obstacles. We all have issues, whether they're physical obstacles, the relational obstacles, their spiritual obstacles or their financial obstacles or maybe their emotional obstacles. We all have things within our life that we try to go through. And they're right in front of us. And, and like Daniel, when he said this, he said, on his mind, uh, I don't want to hurt his feelings, but I can't do this. I cannot lift these weights. So what did he do? He came off the rope. He said, no to this. He started doing his push-ups. That bench press 
was an obstacle that he did not want to face. Why? Because he knew that he could not be successful with that obstacle. He was willing to take a 30-second penalty, Lori, because he knew that the penalty was 30 seconds. He knew that I cannot do that. I'm going to skip that, and I pray that everything else will catch up and I can be successful. In our life, our obstacles, we look at that and we say, I can do this, and I can do this, and I, can do, I can't do that. And God is saying, that's exactly what I want you to conquer. I want you to conquer what you can't because I can. So when you look at your obstacles of your life, you look at your insecurities, your fears, your failures, and you say, I can't do that. Until we deal with your obstacle, your circumstance, the thing that's keeping you from obtaining what God wants you to have, you will never be where God wants you to be. You have to get over your fear of the obstacle. And it may be sin, or it may just be insecurities. It may be your perspective of something. It may not even be reality. Because of your fear, you're not willing to face reality. Now, in this hard charge that's taking place in Wichita, you know, these people that are going to go through the hard charge, they didn't just, they're not just going to get up and say, you know what, I think on April 20th, I'm going to go do the hard charge. I think I can do it. You know what, they're going to be like the fireman, Chad, that does obstacle courses all the time and does marathons all the time, runs bike races all the time. You know, he trains every week in order to do his marathons. But you know what? You cannot go through an obstacle course uh, like the hard charge without training. You have to train. You have to be willing to say, I need to learn how to do this. I need to learn how to do that. I need to be able to do the obstacle course. And good in your heart and get in your mind and know how to do each one of those challenges. In our physical obstacle course, we can look at that and say, I know how to do this. I know how to do that. But our challenges, our obstacles are much different. If we could look at that and say, I know how to deal with relationships. I can deal with each one of those and we can learn how to do it. Or maybe it's our fears of failure, our fe fears of relationships. Man, I can hide and not deal with those things. And I promise you, if we do not deal and train effectively with the obstacles that are in front of us, we will always be reoccurring deja vu on every one of those obstacles. We will be hitting that wall all the time. All the time. And you're saying, why do I have to go through the same exact scenario time after time after time after time after time? It's because we haven't trained and looked at the obstacle and evaluated what I need to do so I personally can deal with that obstacle and face that obstacle with understanding and clarity. Sometimes it takes a trainer. Sometimes it takes somebody that can go through it. Sometimes we have to look at somebody that has success and say, what did you do in order to go through this obstacle? And sit down with them and talk to them. Sit down with them and see a technique, see a relationship, see something that's happened and say, if you would do this instead of this, if you would do this instead of what you're doing, oh, you would be successful. And it may be just like a light bulb go off. Oh, how simple is that? It's all technique, or it's all something that maybe you haven't thought of before. But in every one of our obstacles, we have to look at how does God want us to deal with it. And I look at these, and I said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Which just tells me we have to think in a different perspective. We have to allow Christ to be glorified in me so I can do certain things. We're not talking about a physical obstacle course. We're talking about a spiritual need. And that spiritual need is, I can, I can do what God wants me to do if I let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. God can use me, and I believe there's ways that he can use me if I do certain things. The first is, I need to remain humble and not prideful. I need to understand that those obstacles in my life, they're there to teach me what God really wants within my life. So the failures that I have and the insecurities and the circumstances that I'm going through, if I say, Lord, teach me. I don't know what I'm doing. 
I try this over and over and over and over and I'm getting frustrated. So if we humble ourselves, if we say, I, I really just need to learn how to deal with these things, be humble, be serving, help others that they're going through in their issues and others will help you. It's just serving God and then glorify God when we have successes, when you first get over that first wall and now you can get into the second obstacle. Guess what? There's going to be another obstacle. There's going to be something else that you have to deal with. There's, going to be, there's always going to be obstacles that are in front of you that we have no idea how to go through them. And if you can go through one obstacle, you can go through another. John Maxwell calls it the little wins. If you win this one, you have confidence in God to win the next one. We have to have little victories so when we have a big victory, we understand it's not about me. It's not about how good I am or what I can do. It's that I am allowing God to go through it with me, glorifying God, and be willing to train. Be willing to train. I, in the spiritual realm, the obstacle spiritually is, as, as a pastor, this is the one I struggle with the most with the church, is, is spiritual depth instead of church attendance. I want to have an identity within the church of a growing, vibrant, spiritual body of believers. I, I, I want our church to be growing in discipleship and growing themselves spiritually, not just to have a massive amount of people to come to church on Sunday morning to watch the show, but people that are in love with God, that wants to transform people's lives, that wants to deal with the obstacles that they are facing. And when they look at their obstacles and they face their issues and they have victory with what they are going through, then they can glorify God because God has gave them victory over their obstacles and what they can do then, they can turn around and help other people through their obstacles. We have to have that determination within our life. And then faith. We have to have faith. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, the just shall live by faith. We have to have faith in our decisions, faith in the outcomes, and the faith to serve God. We have to have faith. The faith to know I can trust in God, and God will get me through these obstacles. When we don't have faith, the obstacle becomes the priority. We look at that obstacle, and our focus is on that obstacle, and if that obstacle is winning, we have no faith in God to de deliver us from that obstacle. So we quit in the midst of that obstacle because we don't have faith that God will deliver us through that obstacle. And how we don't have faith because of that is because we've never had victory. It's just one obstacle that I failed, and then I fell at this one, and I fell at this one, and then we look back at our lives, we have all kinds of different obstacles that I'm trying to run around and hide from because I haven't dealt with anything. Because I don't have faith that I can trust in God to deliver me from the issues that are determining the outcome of my life. And I have to have faith that God will work with me. And then I have to have confidence. I have to have confidence. Uh, I love this verse. It's one of the most... <laughs> I looked this up. You know, the favorite Christian tattoo. Okay, do you know what the favorite Christian tattoo verse is? Anybody know? Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 is the favorite Christian tattoo. Everybody has a tattoo. If you have a, I'm just going to... If you have a tattoo that Philippians 4, 13, raise your hand. Okay. So much for my illustration there, but... I'm going to get one just for the sake of it right across my arm, Philippians 4.13. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have to have confidence to know that God will work within our lives. Confidence that in the obstacles, I don't have to quit. I can have the confidence that I can go through stuff. It's going to hurt. It's going to be struggles failures, even embarrassments, but I'm not going to quit. I'm going to stay faithful to what I need to do in order to be successful in everything within my life. Confidence. And then commitment. Commitment. I like this commitment thing. Julius Caesar, when he was commander and they were going to the shores of Britain, he told his legions, he said, march up to the top of the cliff and look back over the sea. So his legionnaires 
walked up to the top of the cliff, and he looks back at the sea, and they see every one of their ships that just brought them to Britain burning. And then he looked at them and he said, there is no retreat. It's either fight to win or die. And I believe in our commitment to God and our commitment to dealing with our obstacles. We have to look back and say, no retreat. I'm going to burn my bridge. What does that mean in the spiritual side? I believe we have to be a commitment that if I have an obstacle that's facing me, that is hindering me from doing what God wants me to do, I have to be willing to burn the bridge that's keeping me from doing what God wants me to do. If it's relational, if it's financial, if it's emotional, spiritual. Whatever it is that you say, that is an obstacle that I have not had victory over in the past, you have to look back at why you haven't had victory over. Is it an individual? Is it a habit that you have? And if it's a habit, we have to say, I'm done with it. If I don't stop this, I will never have that. I will never be successful. Bob Hartman, do you remember the Bob Hartman show back in the 80s? And he was a counselor. And he was sitting there and somebody was telling him, he should, and he said, he said two words. Do you remember what he said? Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. That's, you know, if you come to counsel with me, I, should, I can change our sessions to 30-second sessions. You tell me your problem, I'll say, stop it. That's all you got to do. You look at that and you think, it's so simple. You come and you look at that and you tell somebody an issue, what should they do? Stop it. What is it that's keeping you from accomplishing your goal? It's the obstacle. Find out what you're doing that's keeping you from success. We have to be committed. You have to be committed to the task. And I love Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Before we can run with success, we have to look at what is hindering us from being successful. And if we look at what is hindering us from being successful, let it go. Because we will never be successful if we are not willing to let go of what snares us, entangles us, and holds us down. We have a race to run. And if we are successful in that race, we have to get rid of the junk. We cannot run the race of life with sin that ensnares us from being successful. The charge today is evaluate your obstacles. Look at what is hindering you. Look at what you think, you see, that you are facing time after time after time. And ask yourself, why do I have to face this all the time? Is it my destiny? Is that what I'm supposed to do? Or is it decisions that are keeping on coming on within your life that you cannot maneuver your life away? And I would tell you one of two things. Either God is trying to keep you from doing something really bad, or you're not willing to let God take control of your life. That wall, an eight-foot wall, represents an obstacle, your obstacle, my obstacle. I need to determine how to get over the stupid wall. Because if I don't get over my first wall, I will never be able to accomplish the rest of the obstacle course of life. Your obstacle, your circumstance, your failures, your issues are yours. I can't look at you and tell you what your problems are. I can't look at you and tell you how to get over your wall. I can't tell you how to deal with your obstacles of life. But I know somebody that is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And he knows you completely. He loves you unconditionally. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, trust me. Have faith in me. I know what's best for you. This obstacle is there to keep you from pain 
until you're willing to deal with the obstacle. And once you're willing to deal with it, I can make you get over that wall. I can allow you to understand what is keeping you. But if we just try to deal with it on our own, we may fight through an issue, but that issue is going to continue to come back, continue to come back until we solve the issue, until we change our heart, until we understand that God doesn't want us to be continually in a state of redundancy, going over that obstacle all the time, over and over. He wants to obliviate that obstacle, have victory over that obstacle. I could tell you time after time, people that come in the office say, I'm trying to quit drinking, or I'm trying to quit smoking, or I'm trying to quit this, and this, but it, it seems like the same thing happens every six months, or every eight months, or every two months, and it just keeps on coming back. And you know what? We have to deal with that. We have to look at it face to face in the midst of an obstacle, in the midst of adversity, and say, how can we fix this issue? Forget about everything else. Prioritize that obstacle. Let God deal with that obstacle. Everything else is secondary compared to God and that obstacle. And once you face that obstacle, once you deal with that obstacle, once you've given God that problem, I guarantee you, God will fix that. He'll deliver you from that. He'll forgive you of your sin. He'll forgive you of every issue that you had. And then you can move on with your life. But until we deal with what hinders us, until we deal with that obstacle that we hit face to face to face every day, every week, every month, until we deal with it, we are slaves to the sin and to the obstacle, and we cannot enjoy God's love and enjoy God's forgiveness until we deal face to face, hand to hand, deal with the obstacle that's right in front of us. And I talk to people every day and every week that are caught in that snare. They live their life on the outside with the facade of joy. But when they come in the office and their heart is broken and they can't deal with this one stupid issue and it captivates them, it hinders them from doing what God wants them to do. And there's no joy and peace within their life because they can't deal with this obstacle. And God is saying, you can. You can deal with it if you let me help you deal with it. Let me bring people around you that will deal with it. Have confidence in me. I have the power and the ability to deal with it. You have to trust me. Let me do the surgery. Let me work in areas of your life that will help you deliver from this obstacle. So the charge today is before we get into how to deal with everything, it's going to be this whole month, first thing you have to deal with in the charge, what are your obstacles? What is it that you have to deal with? What is it that you struggle with? It's nobody else's business but you and God. And if you can point out and you can give God at least the acknowledgement of where I struggle, he already knows. But then you agree with him and then you say, Lord, I want you to put me in training. I want you to put me where I need to be in order to give me the ability to overcome the obstacle. And I guarantee you, God will give to you deliverance. He will give to you that freedom. But in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, he says, you have to remove every weight and every snare and every sin that so easily ensnares us, that trips you up. It's easy for anybody else to see. I, we do this kind of thing in role modeling counseling. You could come in and tell me a story, and I can fix your story. I can fix you just like that. I can if you do this, 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 and this, stop it, you would be sick, fixed. But you know what? I can't do that with myself. You could do that for me. I could sit there and I could tell you my story. You say, Bruce, if you would just do this, this, and this, it'd be fixed. It's easy to fix somebody else, isn't it? It's easy. I can look at your problems and I say, stop it. Just quit it. You're hurting yourself. But then I can't do that for myself. I cannot fix you, and you cannot fix me. You know who can fix us? God. But we have to be willing to allow him to fix us. So my challenge today, 
for the next four weeks. Look at your obstacles in your life and give those obstacles to God and let God start working with you through those obstacles. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we have all kinds of issues. In a church our size, there's, there's so many things that ensnare us, that trip us up, that hurt us. But Lord, we need you to help us in every area of our life. And Lord, where we are hitting that brick wall over and over and over again, I pray as the pastor that you will give us the insight. Lord, give us the determination to look at that wall differently. To look at that wall as a challenge. Not as something that has defeated me, but something that can deliver me. The obstacle in my life that has hindered me can be the obstacle that you use to motivate me. Not to defeat, but Lord, allow me to have victory. Those obstacles are yours. Let me look at you for guidance and for training. And over these next few weeks, as we talk about the different obstacles and how to deal with certain things, biblically, Lord, put within our minds my fears, my faults, my sins, and my obstacles, that I can apply the scriptures and your word to fix my issues. Not anybody else's, mine. Because I know that you love me. I know that you unconditionally have forgiven me. And you want the best for me. But I hinder myself from doing what you really want me to do. Be with me today. Be with this church. Guide in our lives. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Pastor Al.